our special guest, or Kim Luz, Luz who is the Div Division Director of Community Outreach at uh, HSHS, Central Illinois Division, Paula Gramley, the Community Benefit Program Manager, Memorial Health System, and Gail O'Neill, who I believe today is being announced as the Interim Director for the uh, Sangamon County Department of uh, Public Health. So with that, I will turn it over to Kim. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you again for inviting us to speak with you. I believe this is the third time that we have presented findings on the Community Health Needs Assessment. We are very excited today to share with you some of the outcomes from our 2015 Community Health Needs Assessment and then also some of the next steps that we will have moving forward out of the 2018 Needs Assessment. So just once again, so everyone is on the same page, nonprofit hospitals are mandated every three years to do a Community Health Needs Assessment through the Affordable Care Act and then the county health departments are mandated through Illinois Department of Public Health to do the I plan or the Illinois planning for local assessment of need every five years. In 2015, our three organizations, St. John's Hospital, Memorial Medical Center, and Sangamon County Department of Public Health received permission to do this triennial process together. And that's when we did our first comprehensive health needs assessment. And we had fantastic results, which we are excited to share with you. So we did that assessment again together in 2018. And right now I'm going to focus on some of the outcomes, some of the initiatives that HSHS St. John's Hospital did in response to the 2015 needs assessment, and then some of the outcomes that we have seen. One of our priorities we identified was access to care. And of course, you all hopefully are familiar with the Enos Park Access to Care Collaborative. We will be sharing more details on that later. We also launched a program called Beyond the NICU. And what that does is provides in-home follow-up with a high-skilled RN NICU, or NICU nurse rather. And this care is to be given to babies who are born less than 32 weeks. Because we know that those babies have the greatest disadvantage, if you will, for poor health health outcomes. And to date, we just launched this in fiscal year 2018, we now have 54 babies, and about 70% of those babies we see come from very low income neighborhoods and zip codes. 64% of those babies were born to families who fall below the poverty level. And so our nurses have been able to go in and work with these families to help meet some of those basic needs, but also provide that ongoing care that will be critical to that baby's uh, brain development as well as their ongoing health development. We do every year the open enrollment assistance. Over the last three years, we've assisted just over 1,000 individuals in enrolling through the marketplace. And we've also assisted more in enrolling through expanded Medicaid. And then in partnership with Compass, Illinois Coalition for Community Services, and other feeding programs, we have been able to provide meals, over 60,000 meals, this 20,000 number is annually, to children and youth who are at risk, specifically those youth who are at risk of going home after school on Friday and not eating a meal again until Monday and who are also at risk of not eating over summer breaks and holiday breaks. And lastly, we have a program called Caregiver Interfaith Volunteer Services, which provides rides to senior citizens to help them get to health care appointments and also meet their basic needs. Our other priority was pediatric mental health, and in collaboration with Memorial Medical Center, we expanded the Mosaic Project in McLernan Elementary School. And then we also launched our trauma-informed care training, adverse childhood experiences, education and awareness, and our resilient screenings. And what this does is it really helps individuals who work with children kind of retrain them on what to look for. If a child is acting out or reacting in a certain way, do we automatically label them bad, or do we say, are they trying to reach out to us and tell us something that they don't necessarily have the words for. So it's really what we are doing to help with early intervention and prevention of child abuse. Another one of our priority areas was pediatric obesity. We have our Got to Dance program and our Got to Dance and Move More program, which we do in the community and in the schools. We've had over 12,000 kiddos dance with us over the last three years. We use this program to really instill strong, positive life skills in children to boost confidence. We've had teachers tell us that the children who participate in this initiative have actually shown increased leadership skills. And some of those kids who were otherwise bullies in the classroom have changed that behavior of being a bully to being a leader and being a strong voice in their classroom. 
We've had wonderful outcomes, self-reported and pre-post-test from parents and children that talk about the increase in self-esteem, et cetera, of the children. We were also the primary sponsor of the Gen H Kids Coalition, and that, again, is a coalition that works to get kids to eat healthier and to move more. And then we placed Project Fit America, which is stationary and mobile equipment in three elementary schools. And on average, classes have shown a 22% annual improvement in skills tested, which sit up 15 meter run. Again, the biggest goal of this is to get kids to move more and to train up leadership skills and life skills, because we know when kids have those essential skills to make proper decisions, high self-esteem, they are going to be healthier adults. And lastly, pediatric asthma was one of our top four priorities. We launched a three-month study involving 25 households and 30 children. That study was done in collaboration with SIU and with Illinois Department of Public Health. And what we found in that, of course, a lot of parents in our families were smoking inside. We were able to work with 80% of those families who, d who said they would and actually showed us that they did take their smoking outside, which was a huge improvement to the respiratory health of their children and everyone else in the home. And then they also 64% of those 80% agreed to take their coat off before they came in. So small changes like that. We were able to teach people safe cleaning skills. There was a lot of mixing of ammonia and bleach. And so we were able to teach them that that could trigger respiratory issues in the family, et cetera. After this three month study, what we really found is instead of taking a specific disease approach, because we were specifically looking at asthma triggers in the home, the families needed a lot more than that. And so that's when we partnered with Central County's Health Centers, SIU, once again, and we helped to support their community health worker program, still working with these families, but to tie in an asthma component to that. And that, with that, I'm going to invite up Paula Gramley to talk to you about some of the outcomes of Memorial Medical Center's health needs assessment. Thank you, Kim. Um, I'm just going to give a quick highlight to um, outcomes that we had. Again, access to care we'll talk about uh, shortly with the Enos project. We also completed a $16 million, 30,000 square foot expansion of the SIU Center for Family Medicine. This is a federally qualified health center, um, and it serves uh, at-risk uh, populations. And the expansion allowed them to add additional providers and reach uh, more patients. Under mental health, uh, we selected to bring Mental Health First Aid, which is a national evidence-based program uh, for um, alerting community members to mental health issues. And we brought the national trainers here to Springfield, and we trained 27 individuals. Um, Gail O'Neill, that's here from the Health Department, was one of those that was trained. Uh, and that was done in 2016. And then in 2017 and 2018, we completed 1,436 uh, people going through that training in Sangamon, Morgan, Logan, and Christian counties. Um, we expanded the Children's Mosaic Project, which helps uh, children uh, be screened for social emotional issues and get quicker access to care. The screening is done in the schools and that program has also expanded to schools in Lincoln and Jacksonville. And just in the last year, 4,055 children were screened and 218 children that were at high risk received uh, mental health services in the school setting instead of them having to go outside and uh, make appointments and find uh, that treatment elsewhere. Um, obesity was our third priority, and with the YMCA, Memorial has uh, obtained certification for a diabetes prevention program from the Centers for Disease Control. We added a Healthy Families component to our Memorial Center for Weight Loss and Wellness. We worked with the YMCA and funded their Healthier Communities Initiative, which was reaching um, out for uh, collaboration with uh, groups that are working with low-income children, addressing physical activity and nutrition. And um, we also sponsor Girls on the Run. 3,168 girls completed that program in the three years that we've sponsored it. And we also sponsored the Gen H Community Garden in the Poplar Place neighborhood. We have a complete report of all of the outcomes on our website. You can see me afterwards if you want any more information on where to find that. Gail? I do go too far. There we go. Um, the Sangamon County Health Department have, we focused a lot of our work to, into our staffing education. 
Um, we don't quite have the resources the hospitals do, and we appreciate when we can jump in and share and learn along with them, which is what we do quite often. Uh, in the area of child abuse, which was one of the priorities uh, the last time, um, we reactivated our Healthy Families Illinois program, uh, rehiring staff that have been laid off during the years of uh, some budget issues with RNs that are actually focusing on, like Kim's program, uh, going out into the homes and making sure that families have what they need to um, raise healthy, happy children. Um, we also instituted some parent support groups, which um, the, the nurse case managers spend a lot of time with trying to identify what their problem areas are and to focus on child abuse prevention and awareness with them. Uh, during this last year and, and recently, a kickoff was October, uh, the health department has expanded with SIU in the federally qualified health center world in our clinics. So it's providing more access to health care for people with illnesses. Generally, we're a preventive um, service with immunizations and, and treating STDs and school physicals. This kind of um, expands the availability of well or sick uh, people services that we really hadn't been able to do for people in the um, that would come see us. So this is expanding and it's fairly new for, to us. So we'll have some results hopefully in the next year or so of how many we've been able to serve and the changes that we're seeing in our clinics. Um, asthma was one of our priorities and a lot of the things that uh, you've just heard about asthma, we've worked with the school nurses to provide some education um, on asthma, as well as with our WIC and family case management nurses that have actually one-on-one -on -one office time with families so they could sit in and focus on um, education in a little quieter one-on-one -on -one environment and they do make home visits so they can kind of follow up and see if asthma is one of the issues that the families are, are dealing with. Um, health departments also, if they don't actually have a priority, they can, are allowed to pick some strategic initiatives, and our Board of Health at that time um, has always been interested in, in infant and maternal issues. Of course, that's where most of our um, personal health programs come, so they wanted to make sure we didn't lose focus on infant mortality and, and maternal health issues, as well as the sexually transmitted disease clinics because of the high numbers I'm sure you've heard about with um, chlamydia and gonorrhea. So those were our issues for the last series. So in 2018, we started our process again. So we finish one and we start talking about the other right away. Um, March through July of 2017, we um, collaborated. It starts with us, but then we recruit people from our agencies to help us look at lots of data. Um, I think the most important thing on the screen is the bottom one where you'll see um, the link to uh, Choose Memorial um, Healthy Communities. That's a resource that when we started this, um, Memorial has purchased and that link is available to everybody in our community and some of the communities where they have hospitals. And it gives you a wealth of information if you're writing grants or just curious about some of the health indicators, they are on there. And it changes and updates. It's a very good resource to the community. Um, so we start just basically um, gathering information. And then we started, as you've heard, a lot of the things that, that we've been doing with our um, communities isn't just you've got diabetes, we're going to give you insulin. There's, there's a lot more to it So with the social determinants of health. So we know that the social economic factors is really important. Their phys people's physical environment, their behaviors, which is often linked with mental health, and their access to health care are very important. So uh, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the social determinants of health, that you know, 21% of a person's health and well-being is related to access to care and the quality of services they receive. Their physical environment has an 80% impact on their um, health outcomes. One of the things that we found most significant in our community was of the social determinants of health, there was way uh, a large amount of families that are headed by single women um, and the number of children living in poverty and the um, lower high school graduation rates. That's something that we need to look at and know that these are issues um, involved in getting Springfield and Sangamon County to be healthier. So after we had a, went through a hundred different, you know, diseases and illnesses and things that were going on in our community from all the resources that we could find, we um, examined them and kind of narrowed them down to the top 18 that had the biggest impacts. Um, we had a community needs assessment committee. Um, some of you may have served on. We gather people from the community that can also bring some more data and some knowledge and sometimes the, they speak for the communities that don't speak to us and are essential in looking at the priority areas that we identified and put more information in. So the core team of, of course is, was our three 
um, organizations and management. Um, we had a community survey, but the core, the community advisory committee helped us um, kind of narrow down which of the 18 we should we should ask the community about and which might be prioritized. As you can see, there's there's a long list of people who participated with us, and this wouldn't be nearly as successful without their help. So when we talked about trying to decide what our priorities were going to be, um, there's a triple, and you may have seen this before, a triple aim impact where you want to um, improve the health of individuals, improve the health of populations, and reduce waste variation and healthcare costs. Um, how big of an issue is this in the community? Does it just affect a few people or a lot of people? Um, how serious is it? I mean, is it gonna cause death? Um, or is it a contributing factor to death? Um, and how feasible is we really can do anything about it? I mean, we, we see things like violence and other things being a priority, but as healthcare facilities, there may not be a whole much impact we can put on that. So that's how we um, defined what the priorities were gonna be. So finally, the Community Advisory Committee, um, whoops, I went one too far. The Community Advisory Committee discussed all the 18 issues and narrowed it down to nine. What we were focusing on, what the next goal was gonna be, was to do a community needs assessment and we couldn't have the community participate in um, something with 18 topics, it was far too many. So we narrowed it to nine and proceeded to do the community survey. Just do the survey. I'm not gonna spend too much time on these slides, but this is just to give you all a good indicator of where our results came from from this community survey. Uh, it was about a month-long survey. Paper copies were also available, which we felt important. We worked with a lot of our social services and a lot of folks from our external advisory council to make sure that individuals who maybe could not take the survey on their own or who did not have computer access, that their voice would still be heard. You'll see that just over 1,000 individuals completed this survey. In, in 2015, we had 781 completed. So we were able to reach a larger population. And right down here, we looked at this in this past survey. 640 responses were from Springfield. We wanted to see where our responses were coming from because another area we did not want to discount was the county, the rural areas. And we wanted to try to work with our uh, towns outside of Springfield to make sure we were hearing their voice as well. So 292 surveys came from the county. This is just to give you an overview once again of who responded. The yellow graphs indicate community survey participants and the gray graphs represent the Sangamon County population. And so what you will see is once again our men did not respond as much as our women. So three years from now we will be doing this process again. So please mark your calendars. We want to hear from the men just as much as the women. One thing that we were excited about is we were kind of able to fill that gap of the Caucasian African American response. The last time we had more Caucasians, less African Americans. And you can see this time with the makeup of our county, it was a pretty good divide. And then of course, another thing we want to look at working on in the future is can we get more of a response from those who have less education because we want to make sure that we're hearing all those voices. So so high school diploma or less, we had less representation. College or advanced degree, we had more representation. Ages of participants from our 18 to 24 year old population, we did not have too many responses, but we did have a pretty good divide across 25 to over 65. And then this is by income levels. About 50% of our responses came from those who make less than 20,000 to 60,000. And then we had a good chunk that came from 60,000 to greater than 100,000. About 12% of individuals did not respond to us what their income level was. We did ask the question, how would you rate the health of Sangamon County? And this is just a, a good chart to show you that 4% said very healthy, about a quarter said healthy, about 60% somewhat healthy, and 14% said that they felt the health of Sangamon County was not very healthy. And we did note at the bottom, there was not a significant demographic difference in how people responded to these questions. One of the things we really tried to work with this survey is to see were, was there a difference in how different demographics and populations responded? Because that helps us in learning how to address the issue. This was the overall ranking by the community survey, by the community participants. Number one was substance abuse, mental health, mental health. I won't read down the list, but you can see how these issues were identified. 
And then again, we looked at the rankings by Caucasian and African American. The top three choices by Caucasian, substance abuse, mental health, and housing. And then the top three choices by African Americans were housing, violent crime, and education. And so there was a difference, although some of them, you know, housing was still in the top three of both, and the majority were in the top 5% of the responses. And then we asked, what is the one thing you would do to make the health of Sangamon County better? And the overwhelming response was access to care. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Paula, who is going to get more into access to care. I'm just kidding. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I do all of my slides. This one's mine too. So before we learn more about access to care, the Community Advisory Committee, these are the things that we ask them to help us do. They help us to identify community access as well as gaps. Why is this important? We need to know what our community already has, and then we need to know what our resources can do to help enhance or bridge, meet those gaps or bridge those gaps. Access to care was not on the community survey, but it was identified. So even though we didn't ask the community, do you feel that access should be a top priority? They still said access to care is one of the top priorities that we feel needs to be met in our community. And then using the defined criteria that Gail went over, the, they ranked the top four community priorities, access to care, mental health, substance abuse, and maternal infant health. And then, of course, the other issues that were also recognized as important priorities for the hospital and the health department to consider were housing, violent crime, education, food access, child abuse, and asthma. So we wanted to provide an update on the Enos Park Access to Care Collaborative. Um, if you did not pick up one of these when you came in, Kim is going to um, hand them out. Um, and I'm not going to go through this handout in great detail, um, but it does um, provide information on what we accomplished uh, over the three years in the Enos Project. We also have a much more detailed report. If any of you are interested in that, you can come up and see us afterwards and, and we'll give you that. Um, but the priority of access to care, uh, we created... Um, it's now going to be called, going forward, the Access to Health Collaborative. But in 2015, St. John's and Memorial agreed to work on one joint priority together. We selected access to care. And we uh, went to SIU Medicine, um, Center for Family Medicine, which is that FQHC, and we talked with them about working specifically in the Enos Park neighborhood. We wanted to take a place-based approach to a defined neighborhood, to take a deep dive on issues instead of something that was community-wide and would spread the initiative very thin. We decided to focus. Um, the Enos Park neighborhood um, is adjacent to the hospitals. We had a lot of information on health and social economic determinants of health um, that were um, uh, difficult issues in that neighborhood. And they also had a great neighborhood um, improvement association that already was used to working together to tackle problems and um, had effective communication channels built into the neighborhood. So we went to Enos Park and we asked if they would be interested in partnering with us on a pilot project um, to see if we could um, impact health in that neighborhood. So what we are learning more and more, um, hospitals and healthcare providers and uh, just across the board, where we live really determines how well we live and also how long we live. And this map of the United States, uh, you can see different states have um, worse health outcomes, um, shorter life expectancies. So it can be affected by state. And then within a state, it can be affected by the county you live in and by the city you live in. And we also know that it is affected even by zip code. So we have information on this map is all of the zip codes in Sangamon County. And we have information on zip codes, uh, well, all the zip codes actually, but 62701, 02, and 03 have the greatest risk of social determinant factors that are correlated with people um, going to the hospital, that it could have been preventable, and also premature death, dying early. So zip, those people that live in those zip codes, and that is um, in Springfield. So uh, 62702 is the zip code that Enos Park is in. We worked with SIU Medicine and um, Tracy Smith. Tracy, are you here? Raise, raise your hand. 
Dr. Tracy Smith is in the back. Tracy has led this program for us. Um, we have, the hospitals have funded it, the hospitals have served in the background on it, but Tracy has done um, all the boots on the ground work to hire the community health workers and work in the neighborhood. And after three years, we've had some really good um, results. Um, one of the first things you have to do is build trust, and this is a big lesson that I've learned from Tracy over the last three years, is that um, trust needs to be established with residents in a neighborhood. And we worked very closely with the Neighborhood Improvement Association. Uh, without their um, support and input, we would not have made the big strides that we did. And there were also a lot of really good connections built with the Springfield Police Department that previously didn't exist. So over the last three years in Enos Park, we increased access to doctors, mental health services, dental health care, pharmaceuticals, substance abuse treatment. People got increased access to insurance, healthy food, Transportation was addressed. Some people got better employment opportunities and better quality housing. And the neighborhood itself identified a priority that children um, were at risk in the summer of not having productive activities. And they have created a summer engagement program. Over the three years, we had 52 children involved in that. We have seen decreases in homelessness. The 911 calls to the police department have greatly decreased in the neighborhood. Crime has gone down. Um, parolees that worked with the community health workers did not return to prison at nearly the rate that other parolees do. Um, unnecessary visits to the emergency department declined among the clients with the community health workers. And inpatient hospitalizations went down. So over a three year period, we were very pleased with what happened. And the program exceeded our expectations. And in 2018, the American Hospital Association um, awarded one of five NOVA awards to our Enos Park collab Collaborative for looking at um, beyond just physical issues and addressing um, economic and social barriers to care. And that award was given to the two hospitals, but without SIU, Center for Family Medicine, none of that would have been possible. So it was a good collaborative effort. So, Coming out of the 2018 needs assessment, we got input from that community advisory committee and from the community survey that access to care is still very important. And our community advisory committee recommended that we continue the work in Enos Park and see what we could do to expand that type of approach. So because we are now moving outside of Enos Park, we have changed the name to Access to Health. We have selected a new neighborhood to go into. That is the Pillsbury Mills neighborhood. It is in zip code 62702, which I told you previously is one of our high risk zip codes. And then we can also look at the census track and those last three numbers are 800. So at the neighborhood level, it is in that census tract. Uh, you can see on the map that it runs from 9th Street to 19th and from north to south, from North Grand to East Carpenter. That 10th Street Railroad Corridor cuts that neighborhood um, off geographically. The old Perry, Pillsbury Mills plant and all the railroad ties going into that cut it off geographically on the other side. And it's kind of this little secluded neighborhood that we've identified a number of issues. Now, we talked about social determinants and where you live can Im impact your health. This is a new um, pro pro program and project from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's called USA LEAP. You can go to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and put in USA LEAP. You can put in an, your address, and it will come up with, based on social determinants factors, what your expected, um, your life expectancy is. So I plugged in an address from Pillsbury Mills, and the average life expectancy there is 72.8 years. For the county, it is 78.3 years. And then I picked an address over in zip code 62711. I just went on to um, the, uh, just a map and kind of zeroed down in online and picked an address at random. It's near the Y on the west side. Um, it's just a random address from that zip code. Their life expectancy is 84.4 years. So from the north side of Springfield to over the west side, we have a difference of 11.6 years of life expectancy. So this program is available if anybody's interested in checking that out. So here are some things that we've learned specifically about the Pillsbury Mills neighborhood. Um, it is a more minority population than the county average. We have a very high number of children below poverty, almost 70% of those children. Um, people below poverty are almost 55%. 
The seniors below poverty are at three times the rate of the county average. Single parent households, 88% are single parent households. And uh, high school education is much lower. And if you remember, Gail said we had already determined there were three significant social determinant factors that are affecting health in Sangamon County. And that is the number of single parent families, children in poverty, and low high school graduation rates. And so those are all impacted in this neighborhood. Some other things about the Pillsbury Mills neighborhood is that their neighborhood association is not nearly as well organized as um, Enos Park. So we are, um, don't have that built-in uh, connection with the neighborhood with communications. They have three very active committed members and some other people that attend, um, but they don't have that infrastructure that Enos Park did. So we are working um, with a new neighborhood association that's different. Um, the, the median household income is 20500 and for the county it's 56700 Only 23% of the residents are homeowners. There are lots of tenants, a lot of turnover, a lot of low-income um, households renting um, properties in this area. 27% of those households don't own a vehicle, and for even those that do, they may not have money for insurance or gasoline. So transportation is an issue in this neighborhood, and it is geographically cut off. There's no school in this neighborhood to serve as an anchor. There's no park. The children often play in the streets. There are very few resources. There's no businesses. There are two small churches and there's not much else in that neighborhood. Um, if you have ever been in that area, the one big thing right in the middle is there's a training center for the Department of Corrections. Um, but that is a training center, and the people that go in and out of there are there for a short time for training um, to work in the, the, the Illinois prisons. Um, so they allow the neighborhood association to use one of their rooms for a meeting, but um, it's not the same as having some other anchor businesses in a neighborhood. Um, so the first steps we're working on are building trust. We have started community health work, and Tracy told us this week that they have identified 11 clients since the 1st of October. So the work has started. The um, priority from this year with the infant mortality are, we had some things happen. It's, ki it's kind of exciting, but it's kind of one of those things you shouldn't be too, too excited about. We started to look at um, the infant mortality rate, and actually any infant that dies is one is too many. Um, even though our numbers have been changing over the years, it has been a topic. Um, what we found when we looked at the numbers, the coroner was with us at one of our community meetings, or our, our uh, work, work group meetings, and shared us with us some data that told us that accidental asphyxiation is the leading cause of death for infants age 2 to 12, and us being public health worker people are like, this is preventable. This is something we actually could do something about and, and find and do a little more research and see what's really going on. Um, so of the raw data that we had gotten, um, some of the data up here is from the Illinois Department of Public Health on the big chart. Um, and it says that infants, that's from birth to through their first year of life. Um, this end is 2001 all the way down to 2016. Um, so our numbers were still, even though we're not talking about huge numbers of children, they're, they, um, they're higher than they should be in other counties in Illinois. It's going up. Um, the trend is going down. However, there's just a little bit of concern. It's higher than the rate that the Healthy People 2020 target would be of having um, no more than six. When we looked at the numbers um, and race and ethnicity, um, you can see that um, there's a pretty good breakup of the black, the white, and the um, mixed race children. But 27 total deaths, 16 of them were accidental asphyxiation. And when we dove into that a little better, it's probably, hope, you know, maybe as shocking to you as it was to us, 11 of them were caused by co-sleeping with a father, a mother, um, other siblings in recliners or couches or air mattresses or in adult beds with bedding. Um, five of the... Um, Infants or ch children were sleeping on the floor on an air mattress, a pack and play, or something with adult bedding in it, of adult pillows and blankets. The coroner had shared with us that sometimes she doesn't really have facts substantiated, but she's there and knows that um, oftentimes there could be alcohol, marijuana, or other sedatives use by the adults contributing to many of these deaths. You know, the new parents are tired and busy and, and snuggling the child, and maybe. Um, 
being a leading cause of death to the, to the children. So it's certainly accidental, and accidental means we might be able to do something about it. So we've begun work um, collaboratively on researching this a lot, and we're excited with the hope that we can do something about this. So we're beginning and, and having meetings with people who are involved in this in the community um, and increasing some awareness. So you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in the future. Um, so the Sangamon County priorities that were selected by our Board of Health, which were a little bit behind um, with our cycle of trying to develop our plans are substance abuse and drugs, mental health and, and mother and infant health. Um, the, in the areas that we'll be looking at with the substance abuse and drugs, we have been for the last two years um, involved in the opioid um, grant, which allowed us to do some community um, involvement and community development and buying a lot of naloxone that we've been able to put in police departments, people's hands, um, doing a lot of training for people that want to have the um, medication that could save a life in an overdose situation. So we um, have been buying a lot of that, and a lot of the $200,000 grant is going right back into naloxone. A kit for, for one um, reversal is, a is $75 per kit to save a life. So, um, and we have had quite a few of those reversals happen. Uh, we um, have been involved with mental health. As Paula said before, our department had two, we're fortunate enough, myself and another employee, to go through the mental health first aid training. And we've trained all of our staff. Now we've got to start working on the new ones. The school district is taking an advantage of us, too, of learning more about mental health with children and adults. We're going to be integrating mental health, a um, little bit case management and referral services and dedicating a staff to do that with the people that come to our clinics. Uh, and in the mother and infant health, we are excited to work together on this accidental asphyxiation and see if we can see some improvement in that. Um, and making our staff aware of how often that happens. So let's see what's going on next. Okay, so St. John's Hospital chose access to care, child maltreatment, maternal infant health, and substance abuse. And some of the strategies that we are going to do to address these that we know of now. I do want to remind everyone that we just completed the 2018 Community Health Needs Assessment. And so a lot of times we think of this first fiscal year as a planning year. Some things we're going to put in place right away, but some things the process is going to inform us what else needs to be done. Under access to care, we are going to continue our access to health collaborative in Enos Park and expand into Pillsbury Mills in collaboration with Memorial Medical Center and SIU Center for Family Medicine. We will also to continue to address access issues through our CIVS program, the one I talked about earlier, which is specific to meeting senior needs, food access, continue funding for Compass and other organizations that work with students who are at risk of hunger, and then access to health care insurance. Year-round, we offer enrollment assistance through Medicaid, and then during the open enrollment and period we will continue to offer enrollment assistance through the marketplace. Child maltreatment is a new one for us this year. We really wanted to focus on this because as we dove into the adverse childhood experiences education and even study on our end, you just see how so many of those individuals who unnecessarily utilize the emergency department or who are in this vicious cycle and they're utilizing at a very high and alarming rate, a lot of times those issues that are those unmanaged chronic conditions, mental health, substance abuse, et cetera, those can be traced back to some adverse experience in childhood. And so while we continue to treat those adults in the emergency department and beyond, we really want to see what can we put into place to prevent or do early intervention in child maltreatment. Alarmingly, the, the national rate tells us that one out of every three girls and one out of every three boys will be sexually abused before they are 18 years old. That is not a statistic that we can sit down and just look at. And so we are going to continue our trauma-informed care training and our resilient screenings. So we are all at least talking the same language. Again, when a child is acting out, they might probably they're not being bad. They're trying to tell you something and they don't have the words to tell you. So how can we be uh, more attuned to that? We are also going to launch human trafficking training for emergency and healthcare providers. Human trafficking is an issue in Sangamon County, in Springfield, 
in Illinois everywhere. It is an issue. And we know that approximately two thirds of people who are still in the life being trafficked will have emergency care at some point. And so how can we train our healthcare providers to understand the signs and the red flags of human trafficking and the develop protocols so that we can help with the intervention process? And then we are going to continue our partnership with Prevent Child Abuse. This is something that started last year and with DCFS to enhance child abuse awareness, prevention, and intervention strategies. Unfortunately, child abuse, human trafficking, those are those things that happen in somebody else's neighborhood. They never happen in ours. And so the more we can understand that they do happen here, the more we will be able to address that. Under maternal infant health, we are going to continue and grow our Beyond the NICU program. That is something that we do in the Sangamon County area, in the Springfield area, and then also in Decatur in partnership with HSHS St. Mary's Hospital. And we are going to continue our support for the Nurse Family Partnership in collaboration with SIU School of Medicine, Memorial Medical Center, and Land of Lincoln Community Foundation. And then with collaborative partners, we will address infant mortality, as Gail was just discussing, um, primarily looking at accidental asphyxiation. And lastly, substance abuse and drugs, that is a new one for us as well. And this community health needs assessment, we will continue to have a hospital liaison serve on the Sangamon County Opioid Task Force. That's something that we just started doing in this fiscal year. And then we also have a hospital liaison serving on the education subcommittee of that task force. We will support our med group, our HSHS med group controlled substance abuse policy in Central Illinois Division Ministries. And then we also partnered with the St. John's College of Nursing this year year to do an interprofessional opioid education event. And I won't read all of these because I want to get through this quickly, but you can see the long list of partners. We partner with organizations, uh, academic organizations that are teaching up clinicians, technicians, etc., to really look at and take them through simulations of how do we need to approach patients differently if we know there is a substance abuse or misuse disorder occurring in their life. And so we will continue to do that education for our next line of healthcare providers. Paula? We're near the end. Um, Memorial selected four priorities. Our first is access to care, which we have talked about um, the health collaborative. Um, we are supporting, uh, continuing our support for programs and education of physicians at SIU Medicine. And we are going to be working with the Y to create um, a new downtown Y um, opportunity pending successful fundraising from the Y. And that will increase access to health opportunities on um, the north and east side of Springfield. Substance abuse, uh, we are developing a system-wide initiative with all four of our hospitals to address opioid abuse. and. Um, this is also including all of our health care providers. And we're also working uh, closely with uh, providers here um, the, with HSHS and with um, SIU and medical groups. There's a lot of work going on to um, co um, coordinate uh, the policies and procedures for opioid and drug use issues. Um, and there's some really good work going on in that area. Um, we're also uh, working on a system-wide initiative that will be working with some of the county initiatives and other things going on uh, to expand access to substance abuse treatment. For mental health, we're going to continue offering mental health first aid. If you have not taken that course, if you're interested in learning more about it, um, it is an eight-hour course. It, the only cost for people to take it is to pay for the cost of the workbook. And you can find information about the course offerings on Memorial Behavioral Health's website, or you can talk with me afterwards. Um, this is a, a program designed for community members, for non-professionals, for people just to learn about mental health. Um, we are going to continue to support the Mosaic program in the schools and supporting Girls on the Run, um, which uh, does a lot with prof uh, helping girls with their personal development. Um, and we are providing support, this is a new one for us, for Memorial Behavioral Health to hire a person to work on a co-responder model with the police department and SIU Medicine for uh, crisis calls for mental health or substance abuse calls from the police department. And we will have um, services available um, to try to uh, connect with those people right at the time. Um, that that is happening. So we're funding Memorial Behavioral Health to have staffing for that. Mother Infant Health, um, the same things that uh, we have just talked about. Uh, we're going to continue support for the Family Nurse Partnership and um, 
with St. John's and the Land Lincoln Community Foundation, and we're going to be looking at infant mortality, particularly the accidental asphyxiation. Information on all of our detailed information is on our website if uh, you want to know any more about the specifics of what we're planning to do. So at that point, I'd invite Gail and Kim to come up. They have, if anybody has any questions. Questions, we've got uh, time for three or four questions. Think this is on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Elizabeth. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm curious about a couple things. One, I'm curious if the hospitals would ever do any advocacy around raising the minimum wage or universal health care as we look at poverty rates in relation to um, access to health care. Uh, so that's the first question. I'm also curious in the Pillsbury Mills neighborhood where it looks like you're doing some work, um, what the cancer rates or asthma rates are in that neighborhood in relation to that closed Pillsbury site and, and also looking at how you're con considering environmental factors. I know I just pulled up the NAACP's cold-blooded report, which looks at power plants, and our power plant is the 47th dirtiest power plant in the country when they wrote their report. I think in 2015 or 2016, there was 378 power plants. So they looked at the uh, three-mile radius population of that. So I'm curious if you're considering environmental factors in the area, as well as advocacy that you all might be, be, be doing. Well, those are two very different questions. I'll, I'll address the Pillsbury Mills one very quickly. We do have information by zip code on cancer and asthma and some of that information, but we do not have that information down to the census tract for that specific neighborhood. So um, if you're interested in more on that, see me afterwards, and I can show you uh, our hospital website that we have, that Gail referenced has a lot of um, information on, uh, can, can uh, help you look to see what the rates are that we have. Um, as far as advocacy, I don't think that's anything that we have directly um, considered um, at this point. Um, it may be going on in another venue of our, um, our health system that I'm not aware of, um, but that is not something that has been brought to my attention personally. And just to piggyback on that, as far as advocacy at the system level for Hospital Sisters Health System, we do have a system director of advocacy, and they work closely with our 15 hospitals across Illinois and Wisconsin. And of course, they work closely with their member organizations, Catholic Health Association, American Health Association, Illinois Hospital Association. And they, they work closely with those organizations so that we have representation and voices in Washington, D.C. that pertain specifically to our local markets. Another question. Yes. David. Given the uh, importance of uh, child health that's been emphasized over and over, where are we in Springfield and Sangamon County with school nurses? We know there's a huge drop off. Has that ever come back up? Is there any effort to increase the, the presence of school nurses throughout the, uh, the county? Um. I think, as you know, there's, there's a lot less school nurses than there used to be, and they are a, a priority I know that the schools have. We meet with them and kind of pull them together at the health department when there's issues that we can bring up at least once a year. We have a, a sharing um, session with some education. Um, I have heard that there is a, a concern they could always use more. I think it's the, the funding that's the biggest problem in the schools because there's obviously a lot of need. Um, but that may, you know, any chance we get to talk with them, especially you'll, you'll see the numbers and how, how active the nurses are with trying to keep kids in school when enrollment time comes. Um, but yeah, that's still an issue that we need to look at. Thank you. Another question? Mike? You know, as I look at this project, this is probably the most successful project I've seen in, in Springfield over the years. And I'd just reiterate what Bob said earlier in his initial presentation, the collaboration. And it's really important for the people in this room to, to realize that every year the hospitals had been doing this, or every three years, the health department had been doing it every five years, but you came together. But coming together was not just the important part of that. What you did was you set up a multi-year process. It wasn't something that was going to happen for one year. You had a partner in the Neighborhood Association, which is just a unique situation 
in terms of really being able to get in to the neighborhood. What you haven't really talked about is the fact that the hospitals put in money to make this happen on a three-year commitment. And at the end of the three-year commitment, they've now put in more money to continue this to go because you can't have something like this take place for one year or two years or three years and then just stop it. So, I mean, you really have, have done a, a fantastic job and, you know, things have, have lined up very, very well. And I think it's really important for the people of this community to realize, particularly in terms of our two hospitals, Memorial and St. John's, just how much they contribute in terms of dollars to this community because while we just talked about this project, we talked about the, the federal clinic, well the one on Cook Street is really supported by Memorial and St. John's. And people really need to realize what the hospitals are putting in in hard cash to, to really try to, to improve this community. Um, okay, last question. Hi, um, I just, you were talking about the Pillsbury Mills um, Neighborhood Association and the fact that they're kind of very new at this and don't have a lot of participation. And I wondered if you had given any thought to bringing in the Enos Park leadership from their association to mentor and bring them along since the, the um, gaining of trust in the community is one of the most important things for your success. I think Paula and I both have Michelle on speed dial over here. I know uh, for more than just neighborhood association questions. But yes, that is something that we have thought very closely about. Uh, Dawn Mobley, who is one of our community health workers in the Enos Park, she really helps with our summer engagement camps. She has been working closely with one of the individuals who sits on the neighborhood association in, in looking at how can we start to do some early on activities and early wins. And then we have also been working with the Neighborhood Association and um, even connected them with ICON, inner city older neighborhoods. And we've connected them with ICON just to look at how can we help them develop a more robust neighborhood association, but also help their neighbors to learn more about the neighborhood association because it's a lack of knowledge. And so Paula and I have done several events within that neighborhood along with the neighborhood association and our neighborhood police officers. Do you want to say anything else? Please thank Gail. You get everything right here, Kim and Paula, for being with us this morning for an excellent presentation. Thank you.